Our next speaker, uh, Enrico Gratan, is here at UCI. Um, he has an appointment in biomedical engineering, physics, and uh, the School of Medicine. He uh, received his doctorate in physics in 1969 at the University of Rome. Uh, he then uh, went and spent uh, about, I think it was 30 years in Illinois at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, UIUC, before he came to UCI, so he likes those letters at least. And um, when, while he was at UIUC, he established a laboratory for fluorescence dynamics um, in, uh, in 1986, so 20, 32 years ago. And since that time, that laboratory has served as a resource to the broader scientific community at large for investigating biophotonic techniques to um, look at all basic science questions and, or physics questions. And it's been hugely useful to countless scientists uh, over the last 32 years, and this is exactly what the NIH pays him big money for, to maintain a resource here at UCI that people from all around the campus, myself included, try to come over and try to learn a little bit more about our questions of interest, while he still pushes the envelope of, uh, of biophotonics. Um, he also works with uh, Bruce Tromberg and, at, at the Beckman Laser Institute, uh, and they've developed devices for looking at, at breast cancer and, and establishing the structure and function in those. But truly, his area is looking at cell function, trying to make diagnoses, and identifying treatments to try and improve human condition. So please welcome Dr. Enrico Gratton. Well, th thank you, Andrew, and uh, well, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. And that's why I want to say another thing. I really, since this morning, I enjoy every single talk. And uh, there is really this synergy between, in some way, techniques that we develop, sometimes for pure curiosity, and then without people like, like you or in really in totally different field that come to us and say, how can I do something? And actually, generally say, well, it's easy, as you know. Uh, that is always my response. And if it's not easy, we will make it easy. And uh, really, our work has been always at the frontier between physics, I'm a physicist, looking just really for pure, pure curiosity to some phenomena which happens in optics, and then, but then, try to collaborate and try to bring people <coughs> who can actually make use of all the things that we are developing. Otherwise, it would be really sterile and would not have any, any effect whatsoever. So say that, I, I really want to thank all the speakers because it's really been a tremendous day. And thank you to organizer for, for organizing this meeting. So what I want to do today is try to cover some of the uh, basic topics that we are currently doing research. And in particular, I want to tell you that actually using spectroscopy techniques and imaging, you can see many, many, many more things. And maybe the galaxy is our frontier. And actually, essentially, you, know, you can see many, many more molecules that ever people imagine that you can see. And there are two ways to see the molecules, as you see. If you label them with the flag and say, well, then you recognize what the molecule is. But generally, in tissue, this is not always possible. And most of the time, you have to rely on what nature has given to you. And well, nature has given us a lot of tools, a lot of uh, flags that we can see and we can measure. And from there, then uh, end up with some uh, understanding of the physiology, of the concentration of molecule, of the structure, and so on. So uh, what I w want to talk today is about the three techniques. OK, so uh, reactive oxygen species are uh, produced by many physiological uh, reactions. And one is giving cell growth, giving cell uh, differentiation are important for the redox homeostasis and uh, for metabolic adaptation. And uh, uh, if we look at that, they are derived uh, by the production of energy. So during the production of ATP, some of the reaction produce reactive oxygen species. And so you can have reactive oxygen species that then produce some other molecules, which are, for example, shown here. They produce lipid peroxidation. And lipid peroxidation 
when lipids are, are oxidized, they uh, acquire a color and they fluoresce. So that is uh, something that can be directly measured. Of course, they are important for DNA damage because the reaction of shale species can produce uh, DNA damage and protein damage. And uh, there are a lot of diseases that were mentioned today many times in which the re reactive os oxygen species can be important, for example, atherosclerosis, inflammation, obesity, cancer, Alzheimer, diabetes, and so on. And you can make that list as long as you wish, essentially. Okay, so let us see what are those things and how people measure reactive oxygen species. Well, reactive oxygen species can be measured by exogenous probe, and there is something which is called a cell rocks, which becomes red in the presence of reactive oxygen species. But I want to say this is not an indicator like will be a pH indicator or calcium indicators. So if you change the concentration of calcium from to a different concentration, you change the color of the, of the indicator. And the same thing you can do, for example, for pH. This is a reaction which is caused by, by the, uh, uh, react the presence of the reactive oxygen species and the dye that you have. And the dye become red, but then if you remove the uh, reactive oxygen species, the dye stay red. And there is, so it's, it's like an integrator. It's not really what I will call an indicator. So there are many autofluorescence markers. We uh, hear about, about one, but there are many more. Well, retinoids, we we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, flavins, etc. And uh, I will talk about fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, but of course, uh, uh, spectral information is as important or even more, and actually, it's even more important if you can put the two things together. Okay, there is no reason not to put the two things together. So, I will talk about this intrinsic uh, stress biomarker, which is the product of uh, uh, lipid peroxidation. Okay, so let us see what is the background. So uh, already Andrew show a little of the background and says, if you have a decay, that you can measure with every pixel of an image, then you can transform that in what is called a phasor plot. And uh, each decay, if it's short, will have a point in the phasor plot which is close to this part. And then if it becomes larger, will move along a semicircle, a mathematical geometrical semicircle, and can move only from one to the other and get to another point. So the beauty of the phasor plot is that if you have two species, one which decays with lifetime tau one and one tau, tau two, tau, uh, the, and in a pixel, you have the combination of the two, well, that point can only be in the line joining tau one and tau two. So instead of looking everywhere, you know exactly where it's supposed to be. It cannot be here, cannot be there, have to be in that line. And that simplifies enormously the analysis. And not only that, but you will see that the analysis here is done only using um, essentially a graphics, geomet geometry. There is never done a fit of the decay. There is never an influence, let us say, of the initial condition in doing a fit, etc. So it's a total fit-free analysis. And this is ideal for people who have not been trained to do a least square fitting of the case because you don't have to. And actually, if you do it, you do something wrong. Okay. So this is a very nice thing. And this is, for example, something that Andrew shows. If you have free NADH, it will be here. If you have bound NADH, and then you have a, in the cells, you measure something. But if you have a trained eye and you pay attention to what is here, you see, well, there is something there in that side, isn't it? which is not in that line. And was this observation by one of my students that started all this research about the reactive oxygen species. So let us see how we can build this thing. So first of all, uh, if you have cells, and those are HeLa cells, and uh, you feed the cell with oleic acid, and then you have just intensity, this is the scale of the cell, you will see that in some points of the cell, there is a new component occurring, which is painted in red. And then if you do CARS, CARS is a method which gives you the, uh, the, where the lipids are, you see that some of those red are in the region of the lipids. So we have a clue that that cause comes from the lipid. 
if we do control, so we don't, we don't fit with oleic acid cell, we don't have anything, and we have a normal media, nothing happens. So clearly, it has to relate to a metabolism of this uh, uh, oleic acid. So we can do more than that, and uh, for example, uh, we can uh, pick up one of those granules here, which actually I will show you those are granules, and then the granules appear in another technique, which is called third harmonic uh, generation, which is using three photons at a time in order to generate a signal which is not visible in any other way. Uh, and so it's one of the other tricks that physicists came out in order to do microscopy uh, of tissues, and uh, you will see the importance of that. Okay, so if you isolate that, po that point and look, for example, at the Raman spectra, you can do that very easily. You can immediately see that uh, uh, if you do, for example, just oleic acid, that the lipid drop has an extra band. The extra band has been characterized by other people, and that in, uh, only appears if the lipids are oxidized. So we know that what is the origin of that band. So now we can feed the cells with a lot of oleic acid, and now you can see whatever before was just a hint that something was happening, now you can see there is something else which is developing in that region. Now, following the rule of the phase, everything which is in that axis has to do with metabolism. Will be glycolytic if we are here, will be oxyfox if we are there, and now we have a different axis. And then, the, essentially, this algebra phaser, which you just look at the graph, you don't do anything, uh, will show you, actually, if you draw a point from here, where we'll intercept the, what we call the universal circle, and then we'll be able to quantify what is the amount that we have. And so this is done here, and this is what I call at the beginning LLS. So now we have like one major axis, which is the metabolic axis, another axis, which is the reactive oxygen species axis, and you can quantify exactly what's happened in the cell and eventually in the tissue, eventually in the organoids. Actually, the organoids have a lot of this signal, by the way. Okay. So now, well, this is the, the result of that analysis, and now you know that all these uh, uh, reactive oxygen species actually, they reside in vesicle, and the cell if you wait enough, actually will bring those vesicles up to the extreme and then will expel to the medium. And that happens also in the organoid, by the way. Okay, so I don't know if you have ever seen that, but, but this is what is happening. And that's very interesting because it's something which is poisonous, we say, toxic for the cell, but the cell has a mechanism by which actually uh, those uh, products of oxidation are expelled by the cell. Uh, well, this is just to show that uh, if you, uh, you can make this part larger or smaller, depending on the amount of, of reactive oxygen species that you create, or actually, in that case, the amount of lipids, oxidized lipids that you have. And uh, so this is something which has not, was not known before, and although it was evident, and if you look very carefully to your graphs, you will see that there is a tail going in that region, and if you follow it, you will see that actually that happens because the stem cell that you start with are very active, otherwise will not generate the, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the um, a, a kind of things that you have, those organoids, and that always is related to the generation of this reactive oxygen species. And then there is a way for the cell to get rid of that. And actually, it's very interesting what happens in the cell, not in the culture, but now if we look in the tissue and what, what is happening about this signal. So now uh, we want to see, first of all, if you have fat. So those are fat cells. Uh, this is a white fat cell. And uh, as you know, they have a really large uh, uh, fat reservoir, a small cytoplasm, and then you will see uh, what is happening. So if you measure the flame in that cell, you are almost exactly like 100% of the, of the fluorescence that comes from this part comes from lipids which has been oxidized. And uh, so this is the fluorescence intensity. So if you look at how much is in that red part, well, it's everything in that red part, and then we can do more in detail look at the third harmonic generation, which actually 
is a physical process that only got, have a signal if the um, uh, electric field of the wave propagate at the interface between two media with two different in the, in the sort of fashion. So water and fat will give a signal. And will give a signal independent of the fact you have a molecule or not. It's just a difference of index of refraction. As a matter of fact, if you have glass and water, well, you have molecule of water and molecule of glass, you still get a signal because it's a change of the index of refraction. This is a, a physical principle, have been used very little, but is very powerful because it gives you the information about where the fat and eventually how much fat you have and how it's distributed. Okay, so. Let's go on with that, and this is, you can map all of them, and uh, so those are tissues which contain an adipose tissue, and you can see very well, you know, where all the, so the red is supposed to be the fat, and that is the border, which is where the changes of index of refraction are occurring, and then you can separate the two parts very well. Okay, so let us look an application to cancer to that, and this is uh, a, a, in melanoma cell, and in melanoma cell, you have an enormous amount of that component, by the way, okay? And that is, in, in some way, a very easy way to figure it out if a cell is a melanoma cell or, a, or is a simple melanocyte or whatever. And uh, so you can see the fluorescence intensity. Of course, you cannot say anything, but if you paint in a color everything which is in that part of the plot, well, you can paint exactly where the result of the reactive oxygen species has occurred. And they are in those very long extensions of the cell, and that end up to be characteristic only of the melanoma cells. I think this is the melanocytes, which are, show nothing. So the control shows nothing there. Okay, so you see how you can use those uh, intrinsic markers for essentially a cancer, uh, and then I will have other a thing which have also a other sort of imaging, and this is, for example, what happened in cardiomyocyte. If you uh, um, um, submit a cardiomyocyte to epoxia, which generate reactive oxygen species, and you can see again that you have a certain amount of uh, in, of the metabolism, but you get that part, which is absolutely clear if you know where to look at. And that is, is there, and this is showing that it depends on the, there is a significant increase of that component. Well, you can see from here to here, and then everything becomes there. At, at the moment, you submit the cardiomyocyte, for example, to lack of oxygen or something like that. Okay, so I will do another one, which is about fibrosis and lipids. We talk a little bit today about fibrosis. Actually, the signal of fibrosis is very easy to see in many other ways. But if I, by, by uh, those techniques, it's absolutely easy to see, and you can quantify, and you can see everywhere where fibrosis occurs. So there was a discussion this morning about that. And this is the kind of uh, system that we use, and this is simply to indicate that you have an electron, which is part of the molecule. You move the electron, and depending how you move it, you can obtain second harmonic generation, third harmonic generation, or you can promote to another uh, state and that will be absorption and so on. And I will not go through any detail, but this is the system that we are trying to use with uh, um, Andrew for look at the eye. And this is an upright system, so this is uh, important. And this instrument, in the way we build, can look at about at the distance from the surface of the lens to the plane of imaging, which is about three centimeters was not built for the eye, but it's almost ideal for the study, at least of an eye, well, uh, of, in this, uh, uh, I say the size of a human eye. Of course, uh, a mouse eyes or other things will be very easy to do. Okay, so that indicates two photon excitation. That was already, so I just want to say that the two photons are borrowed from the same laser, not from two different laser, but anyway. In some way, your explanation, probably everybody understands. If I say that, nobody will understand me, so I will use your explanation, okay? And uh, so this is second harmonic generation. This is the effect of third harmonic generation. And on this instrument, we have the capability to choose a filter that will filter out, for example, only the third harmonic generation, will filter out only the second harmonic generation, or will filter out only 
the fluorescence, for example, from an ADH, and eventually from FAD, from retinol, from any other things that, that, that you want to have. Okay, so this is an example of fibrosis in a bone. First of all, this is just to show this scale is not wrong. This is a, 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 a bone uh, uh, from a mouse. And so this is two millimeters, so it's not two microns. And so you can image a really very, very large area. And so, well, essentially shows here how big it is. And here is uh, painted in two colors. And those two colors, let us see what is the origin of those two colors. So there is no markers there. It's just intrinsic markers that we are using. So uh, I, will not, I, I will show a little bit about the uh, effect of the diet and other things. So let us see how the signal there originate. So what originates is the following, that working in, in uh, 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 collagen, I know, or essentially reading the literature, not because I know, uh, and because I have done measurement for many years of my, of my life, is that if you look at collagen one and collagen two, they have second harmonic generation, but collagen three, collagen four, and collagen five have fluorescence. So if you want to distinguish one from the other, you can just look in the phaser and look at the position, and you will tell that is collagen one, that is co actually there are many more collagen, but you can distinguish all the different collagens just by, by seeing the position that you have in the, in the phaser plot. And that is the position that we will have. So this is, for example, for five different collagen. And then if we mix that with uh, the second harmonic generation, which is only due to collagen one and collagen two, you get really a very, very strong uh, uh, information about what is happening there. So here are, for example, well, the black and white picture, the autofluorescent, the second harmonic generation, which come only from that part, and that have to be collagen one the autofluorescence plus flim, and this is the part which is due to the, the disease, which is due to the formation of fibrosis, because in that case you have a different kind of collagen, which is absolutely easy to pick it up, so the contrast is, is very, very large between one point and the other. And, and that is the way we separate, so you select one by a region here in the phase of plot, another region, and this is for the, call, for the second harmonic generation. So you have just three components that are easily separated. You make no fit, nothing. Everybody can do that, provided you know what is the map of where those things are supposed to, to occur. So, uh, so that is the, essentially the paper, and this is the, the kind of uh, difference that we have, and if you look at the color image, you color according to the tree color, well, it's very clear the difference between wh when you have the, the control mice toward these mice that produce this uh, fibrosis. Okay, uh, now we go to the famous image of the fat mouse. You have already seen that. I think you know, this mouse is becoming a star in, the <laughs> in our field. Okay, I don't know if it's he or she, but anyways, it's a star. And uh, uh, so, what I want to show is a very different uh, conclusion, is that if we look very carefully about some of the organs in the mouse, we can see immediately what is the effect of the diet, and we call that Western diet, which means essentially McDonald's di uh, diet. So, so this is a very polite way to say. So we look in the liver in the, in the mouse, and uh, so you extract the liver, and uh, if you have a Western diet, you will immediately see, I will show you in a moment, that it's completely different than if you have a low-fat diet. But this is not just a difference. Now we can analyze chemically, or, or, or let us say biologically, what is the difference that we obtain. And that is really the important thing that I want to come up with my talk, is that we have a tool not only to say it's disease or not disease, it's, it's happening, or, but you can say what is happening, at least at the level of molecular of the molecules, and this is very important here. So let us see what is happening. So first of all, if you get the, the Western diet of the wild type, you will see immediately that uh, there is a very difference of the size of those dro the droplets, which actually are picked up by these long lifetime species, and in a normal diet are much smaller, and you can make 
Uh, so one is picked up by that component, and you can see, for example, you can make a statistic of the size of the droplet. I don't know, for example, in TI, how many of the bodies that we see in the retina are really due to fat or they are a fat component. I don't know if that is known or not, but maybe that is it's a, it's a very important point. And then you can decompose, and then you can say how much is fat, how much is metabolic, and, and the, uh, resolving three components, which is actually quite complicated. One thing I will not say, but this method is completely quantitative. OK, so when we say that an ADH is more bound in uh, uh, oxyphos than in glycolysis, still more bound, you are not telling me how many micromolar of uh, NADH you have, because that can be very important for the cell. And uh, so this is just to show you that using a, a different method, I don't have time to present that, actually you can be completely quantitative. You can say, with two significant, three significant digit, what is the concentration of the molecules you are having? seen that. And that can be very important for your organoids because you show uh, retinol, whatever, but now you want to say, how much is that? Uh, how many, uh, whatever, uh, micromolar do we have? And you can be quantitative, and that is something, maybe we never discuss about that, but you can do that uh, with the same technique without complicating anything. So finally, I think I want to finish with some image of the um, uh, choroidal uh, 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 section on the human eye, and those are actually done by, Mac, uh, by Dr. Macmillan, who is, uh, uh, well, we have consult, is consulting with me about how to do the phase of plot and so on. And here you have whatever, the bright field, this is the two photon excitation, and this is resolved at different depths. So this is the very dark uh, flat mount, then you have the mixed, you have the very light, and then you cross the section and you get the very uh, dark part again. And you can see here that just by proper choosing the uh, phaser in the phaser plot, you can color essentially at will the image and then you can see every single detail. And instead of having, well, it's not instead, the, the OCT is absolutely fantastic, powerful, but here you can see every single cell and every single cell in depth and color them with different a thing, and actually the color here is made in such a way that you can see a, the a melanin component, and so I will tell you exactly where the melanin is in, in all those images. So this is, I think, a very powerful method because it's really telling you what you have in the cell, which is absent. So you see the, 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 the essentially, the anatomy by OCT, fine, absolutely fantastic. But here, you know, essentially, you can say every single cell what is done. Okay, and this is where we want to end up. And so, finally, I want to reach the conclusion that says the film of tissue identify molecular biomarker, but I show metabolism and oxidative stress. But there are many, many more. Of course, lipofusion is one of them, and then lipid droplets. You can see the lipid droplet without any contrast mechanism because of the lifetime and because of the third harmonic generation, so you don't need to add anything. You, we use a lot of this nonlinear uh, microscopy. You mentioned two photon absorption, but of course, there are many more ways to, to combine photons in, in the molecule. And that gives us the possibility to look, to look directly at other things like where are and how big they are and, and how many lipid droplets you have about collagen. Well, we, I didn't talk about myosin, myelin, in the nerve, the myelination and other things which actually can be very important for the nerve analysis. We never, have never done that. We have this microscope that we hope to be able to use in, in this collaboration. And I say it is, has a really, really big field of view, but at the same time can zoom in at the level of single cell, actually at the level of, the, of a nucleus of a cell or at the level of the chromosome. And uh, so I say that there are many other things that can be done with uh, this sort of microscopy. And uh, I want to finish saying thanks to Rupsa Datta. Rupsa was my graduate student who did all the work on the um, oxidative 
uh, of the reactive oxygen species. Uh, Suman Ranjit, who is a postdoc in my lab, and he did all the work uh, with Moshe Levy about uh, liver and about um, a, a fibrosis of bones and so on. And Sasha, uh, who built a diver microscope. This is my lab, and thank you very much for listening to me. So a totally different distribution. So those red dots, which of course indicate reactive oxygen species, are, are, are vesicle. And the cell is pushing to the border. So they are always found in that position and always in, in, in that part. The images I show, those are um, uh, in tissue. So we did with Bruce Schomberg, uh, just looking at tissue. So the, the melanoma in, in a tissue, well, extracted tissue, and you can see that very, very well. So I don't, I don't think you can make a confusion because it, it is so specific and is not found in the normal melanocyte, it's zero. It's only in the eye, and the reason is because you have to reach the, the essentially the bottom of the eye. And so we are de developing, I say, this, this uh, microscope that has, well, we develop for other reasons, but it's particularly uh, proper for what he wants to do. So recently we acquired a, an objective that has three centimeter of uh, working distance. And uh, we know, for example, the surface of the eye, you can add a cup in such a way to appear flat, and then uh, still we have to focus inside and uh, you have to pass through the lens, and the lens is a horrible, well, it's a wonderful <laughs> uh, uh, device, but it's horrible from the optical properties. So we built now all an adaptive optics system that will compensate for the shape and the various part. And so we have this adaptive optics, actually now it's working, you're going to see. And so in some way, motivated by what Andrew wanted to do, we simply develop a little bit more that microscope. So yes, we want to use in, in, in the human eyes. Uh, for an animal eye, it will be very easy, but human eye is a little more complicated. But 